Good afternoon, everybody. We will begin today's program by offering flower tributes to the bust of Dr. Rajendra Mitro kept here. I will request our president, Professor Shapun Kumar Pramanik, to please come. <clears throat> Our past president, Professor Pallav Sengupta is here with us this afternoon. I'll request him, sir, please. Now I will request members of Dr. Rajendra Lal Mitra's family who are residing in Kolkata to please come and offer your floral tributes. And you can I will now request the members in the audience to please come one by one, whoever likes to do it. Now I request our General Secretary to offer flower bouquet to the bust of Raja Ranulamitra. So, may I now request our today's speaker, Professor Taputi Gothakurta, to please come. Our council members and other members in the audience may please come. In the meanwhile, may I request our president to please come. Professor Pallav Shanguptu. President, please. Professor Shanguptu. A treasurer, Dr. Sujit Kumar Dash. <coughs> May I now request our president to please hand over this flower bouquet to the speaker. Now we begin with an invocation being rendered by one of our colleagues, Sri Amit Kumar Ghosh. Prashpuraniva Driti Dinad Mata Adriva 
मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य यदि प्रस्फुर निवादृतिर्नदमात आदृव क्रवा समीनता प्रतिपंगजगमाशुचे क्रवा समीनता प्रतिपंगजगमाशुचे मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य यदि प्रस्फुर निव धृतिर्नदमात आदृव अपांग मध्य तस्थिवांग संषण विदर्जरिता मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य मृड़ा सुक्षत्र मृड़य यदि प्रस्फुर निव धृतिर्नदमात आदृव जदि झड़े रुमे घेर मत दाई चंचल अंतर तब दया करु हे दया करु हे दया करु हे ईश्वर जदि झड़े रुमे घेर मत दाई ओहे अपापु पुरुष दीन हीन इसे पाप रुकुले प्रभु दया करो हे दया करो हे दया करे लौ तुले जदि झड़े रुमे घेर मत दी जले रुमा झारे बास करी तबु त्रिषाय शुकाए मरी प्रभु दया करो हे दया करे दाओ सुधाय हृदय भरी जदि झड़े रुमे घेर मत दाई चंचल अंतर तब दया करो हे दया करो हे दया करो हे ईश्वर जदि झड़े रुमे घेर मत रेस्पेक्टेड चेयरपार्सन अब दिस मीटिंग प्रोफेसर स्वपन कुमार प्रामाणिक who is also the president of the asiatic society our past president professor pallav sen gupto today's endowment 
lecturer Professor Tapati Guhothakurta, my colleague Dr. Sujit Kumar Dash, treasurer of the Asiatic Society, Professor Basudev Borman, one of the vice presidents in the Asiatic Society, and many other sectional secretaries and council members are present here. Distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Before I deliver my welcome address, may I request our treasurer, Sri Dr. Sujit Kumar Dash, to kindly uh, offer this uttoryo to Madam Speaker. Friends, you know the occasion. After a long interregnum, we are meeting in physical mode in this complex of the Asiatic society. On the occasion of this annual endowment lecture, in the name of Dr. Raja Rajendralala Mitro, the first Indian president of the society, who was president, as you know, most of you know, in 1885. And this is a period when we are also observing his bicentenary. And as part of that bicentenary programs, we have arranged a few academic programs by way of organizing seminars, workshops, publications, exhibitions. Very soon, we will have a special pavilion in the Calcutta International Book Fair, Kolkata International Book Fair, in the name of Dr. Rajendra Mitra, where we will put up a small exhibition on his works and contributions. And for your kind information, you will also discover in this very building, there is a hall dedicated to display in the, in the way of displaying very many documents of Dr. Rajanura Mitra, his contributions, etc. And uh, I'll not go into the details of it because our speaker today, she will talk on Dr. Mitra at length and a reprint is already available outside and on this occasion, we will release a new edition of, you might have seen in the program, the Sanskrit Buddhist literature of Nepal. And also we have another seminar publications. The seminar was held in 1974, and the publication came out in 1978 and it was reprinted once in 2019 and again getting I mean, being available as reprint outside. Those of you who are interested in laying your hands may please do that and there is a person in the counter probably on the occasion of uh, this uh, pious program uh, they will also allow some discount to the tune of 50% or so. And today's speaker, I think to this audience, it is really redundant on my part to introduce her. But nevertheless, as the convention would demand, she is Professor Tapati Guthakurata, an eminent historian and emeritus professor of history and former director for the center of for the center of studies in social sciences in kolkata and apart from his many contributions for ready reference as i have noted here i would mention Her first book, The Making of a 
new Indian art, aesthetics, artists, aesthetics, and nationalism in Bengal. It was published by Cambridge University Press in 1992. The second publication that is with my knowledge now, Monuments, Objects, Heritage, Histories, Institutions of Art in Colonial and Post-Colonial India, published by Columbia University Press and Permanent Black, 2004. The third one, in the name of Goddess, the Durga Pujas of Contemporary Kolkata, published by Primas Books, Delhi, 2015. Apart from her other many contributions in the form of uh, uh, exhibition monographs and many others, she, as I have found out, two very important compilation, edited work is there, Theorizing the Present, Essays for Partho Chatterjee, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. Another, New Cultural Histories of India, Materiality and Practices, again published by Oxford University Press, Delhi, 2013. This is in brief, as I could quickly jot down, and without wasting any further time, I would request Professor Pallav Shengupto kindly to release the book which is waiting for today's function. Please. Professor Shapot Kumar Pravarnik, President of this August Conclave, Professor Tapati Gohatagurta, Dr. Shotrabhut Chakravarti, Dr. Shujit Kumar Dash, and my friends and colleagues. I really feel myself lucky and absolutely honored for having a chance of being associated with this world famous book of my illustrious predecessor, Dr. Rajendra Lala Mitro. <clears throat> Actually, the republication of this book was primarily contemplated some 10 years back. During the celebration of Rabindranath Tagore's 150th birth centenary, the Asiatic Society had organized some seminars. In one such occasion, a scholar from the overseas asked whether Rabindranath was in any way associated with the society. Only then it transpired that many of his poems and plays had their origin in the several stories collected in the book. Rabindranath himself was much respectful for Rajendralal. And that is evident from his memoir, Jivan Sriti. However, since then, we have been planning to issue a new edition of this book, and that project come into the reality on this occasion of Rajendralal's 200 bath centenary, which will only four days back, 16 February. Finally, I thank my friends in the administration of the society for giving me a chance, this honor. I thank them and I thank you all. Thank you, sir, for your kind presence and keeping our request for this job today. Now I would request our endowment lecturer, Professor Taputi Gothakurata, for which you are anxiously waiting. Before that, let me share with you, we introduced this endowment lecture since 2017. 
and the first lecture was delivered by late president sri pranab kumar mukhopadhyay who was for a long time the chairman of our highest policy making body the planning board of the asiatic society the second lecture was delivered by professor k paddaya eminent archaeologist the third was by professor uh, malavika karlekar this is the fourth endowment lecture of 2020 and for 2021 we have also selected the speaker professor goya charun tripathi an eminent sanskrit scholar so this is in brief the history of this endowment lecture now madam please when i heard about the very eminent speakers who had preceded me uh, that does make me very nervous to think that the president himself had delivered this lecture uh, followed by professor k padaya and professor malubika kallekar in fact professor um, uh, malubika kallekar's book is something uh, i referred to quite a lot when i was trying to think about rajendra lal mitra's career as also a pioneer in photography which is not something that many of us know so much about anyway i like to thank uh, all the members of the asiatic society the president the general secretary uh subhash ranjan chakraborty subhash babu who i know personally well for inviting me to be the endowment scholar and to deliver this lecture um i have not had the opportunity to do new research so i'll be drawing largely on the work i did several decades ago um uh, So there is a section on Rajendra Lal Mitra. So in a way, uh, this invitation gave me the opportunity to go back and think about this extraordinary scholar and his work once again. So in a way, I'm returning to think about and about Rajendra Lal Mitra and his career after a long gap. Um, but I drew sections out of earlier writing. to make today's lecture but i look forward to actually looking at the documents which are on display in the asiatic society uh, i hope if not today at some other opportunity i'll be able to come and do that okay the title of the lecture pundit to scholar rajendra lal mitra and the worlds of antiquarian scholarship in 19th century india um the title of the lecture pundit to scholar draws on a citation from the world famous german indologist professor max muller uh it's available okay uh max muller uh endorses raja rajendra lal mitra with the following words i quote him he is a pandit by profession but he is at the same time a scholar and critic in our sense of the word He has proved himself completely above the prejudices of his class, freed from the erroneous views of the history and literature of India in which every Brahman is brought up, and thoroughly imbued with those principles of criticism which men like Colebrook, Lassen, and Burnoff have followed in their researches into the literary treasures of the country. Uh, so. an interesting quotation where he refers to rajendra lal mitra as a pandit which in a strict sense of the term he wasn't in a different sense of the term amra jodi panditer kotha bhabi of course he does belong and he's not a brahmin either but nonetheless it is this transition that max muller refers to which will be somewhere at the heart of this lecture in the estimation of the european masters Rajendra Lal Mitra had made the crucial passage from prejudice to reason, from tradition to modernity, to emerge on par with the Western Orientalist. Rising above the role of native informant, he had emerged as a modernized Indian with the same, if not a greater, claim to expertise as the European. 
with a focus on the emerging field of India's architectural and archaeological history, which is my area of specialization. Today's lecture will consider how Rajendralal Mitra's career marked this critical transition in the forms and functions of native expertise. I use the term native within quotes. It's something uh, that the Indian is referred to now as a native across classes. His eligibility to participate as an equal in the institutional worlds of European scholarship in the mid-19th century India singles him out as a first Indian in a number of spheres. Through Rajendralal Mitru, this lecture will revisit the nature of this shift from native informant to modern scholar, from antiquarian to disciplinary spheres of knowledge on India's ancient scripts, epigraphs, texts, and monuments. It will pose the following main questions. How does the modern Indian expert bring with him a new set of stakes and contestations of authority within the field of knowledge? On what terms does he take on from the colonial masters the full drive of recovering India's civilizational and architectural antiquity? How effectively can he take on the prerogative of challenging the viewpoints of European scholars when he feels necessary? This section is called the first in the field. I begin by rethinking the inaugural moment that is presented by the work that Rajendrola Mitro embarked on in the 1860s and 70s under the aegis of the colonial government. It is Rajendrola's eligibility to participate in the European scholarly sphere that clearly marks him out among his contemporaries. As one of the most distinguished public figures of 19th century Calcutta society, Rajendrola Mitro stands out as a first in many fields. Along with Darukanath Tagore and Ram Komal Shen, he is among the first Indians to be admitted to the scholarly offices and activities of this institution, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, where he's appointed assistant secretary and librarian in 1846. Within the society, he is the first Indian member to regularly contribute to the proceedings of the society the first to take on the large-scale collecting, cataloging, and translation of Sanskrit texts, and the first to publish a large body of edited and annotated Sanskrit texts in the renowned Bibliotheca Indica series, which he helped launch in the 1860s. Now, we know that in when Rajendralal Mitra is writing the centenary history of the Asiatic society, uh, he is only one of five Indians to have been members of the society then. And it is, of course, a great honor to him that he is selected to write uh, a kind of centenary history. Okay. The scholarly credentials of Rajendralal Mitra jostled with his public visibility, with his membership on committees and associations that stretched across the diverse spheres of the intellectual and cultural political life of Calcutta. Forgot to show my next slide. So this is, of course, an early image which I found on the internet of what the Asiatic society would have looked like. This is from the 1820s, but I'm assuming, uh, I don't know whether architecturally how much would have changed between then and the 1840s when Rajendralal Mitra joins the society. Now, Rajendra Mitra, so he's part of diverse associations ranging from the field of photography to the emerging field of publishing. He became what Malavika Kalekar has called the quintessential committee man of the 19th century. For instance, he was a founding member and treasurer of the Photographic Society of Bengal that began in 1856 where he masters the technique of daguerreotypes and becomes a regular contributor to his journal. In 1858, he became the director of Calcutta Wards Institution, an institution set up to provide Western education to sons of zamindars, a post he took up after more than 10 years of service at the Asiatic Society. In the same years, he was also a founding member of the British Indian Association one of the earliest Indian political organizations in the empire, 
and more important, he was uh, editor of two pioneering Bengali monthly miscellanies in the 1850s and 60s, Bibidharto Shangraho and Rahosho Shangraho. I was delighted to see so many pages from Bibidharto Shangraho on display here. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. It is a pioneering journal uh, with wonderful wood engraved illustrations, which was very rare at that time, possibly done by Western artists or taken from Western magazines, and it is printed at the Baptist Mission Press. So I'm delighted to be surrounded by engravings and pages from Vividat Toshambo. That such a person like Rajan Rola should have been awarded a string of titles by the British government, Rai Bahadur in 1877, CIE, Commander of the Indian Empire in 1878, and the title Raja in 1888 comes as no surprise. That he should have taken on from his colonial masters the full drive of the retrieval of the ancient Indian past also seems natural. It could be argued that the eminence of Rajendralad's intellectual and public profile was what enabled him to not only enter the world of scholarship as an equal, but also to contend and correct European interpretations when he felt necessary. Neither such eminence nor such self-assurance was however representative of the wider world of native involvement in the study of Indian antiquities. This becomes all too apparent when one considers some of the main ways in which the newly established Archaeological Survey of India drew on local assistance and information. During Rajendola and Mitra's times, 1860s and 70s, a modernized professional forum of training and employment for local scholars in the realm of archaeology was yet to emerge. The Indian archaeologist was a missing entity still, a vacant intermediary space waiting to be filled. He had as his stark contrast the ignorant villager, the superstitious temple priest, the vandalizing raja or zamindar. Now these are not my labels. These are labels in the colonial reports. Each of these, ignorant villager, superstitious temple priest, people who for ruins and relics, remained oblivious of their historical value and often actively obstructed the work of European excavations. Such figures form a recurrent motive in the story of colonial archaeology underlining the urgency and importance of Western intervention. Alongside also emerged the figures of the site laborer, the informant, the trained draftsman, often trained in the government school of art, and the Sanskrit pandit, those who dug mounds, prepared drawings and plans for the sahib, identified sculptures, coins, or inscriptions, and often helped them decipher scripts and epigraphs. While one group sharply offset the colonial project, the pilfering Raja, for instance, those who carried away uh, and, you know, stones from old sites, the other, the draftsman, the laborer, the pundit, served as the invisible props of the establishment. Neither, however, belonged to the new kind of professional scholarly circuit that Rajendrola and Mitro inhabited. Both remained far removed from the new middle class society that would span the professional Indian scholar. In the early scholarship of Indian temple architecture, uh, I'll begin with a figure who emerges as a crucial predecessor, but also presents a sharp contrast to Rajendralal Mitra. This is the South Indian author called Ram Raja who the colonial masters called Ram Raz. His dates are 1790 to 1833. His book, Essay on the Architecture of the Hindus, came, on, came out under the auspices of the Oriental Translation Fund of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland. It was a posthumous publication because the author died in his 40s just the year before. A native of Mysore, Ram Rajas, I'll call him Ram Raja rather than Ram Raz, though the author, he's known as Ram Raz. Ram Raja steadily climbed from the rank of clerk in the Madras Native Regiment 
to the head of the College Office and head English master in the College of Fort St. George, to native judge and magistrate in Bangalore, was a clear sign of his successful negotiation of Western patronage and employment. A simultaneous sanction of his scholarly status came with his admission as a corresponding member of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland, which undertook the publication of this work of 1834. His skills as a translator and his command over several vernacular languages, Marathi, Kannada, um, Tamil, uh, Hindavi, the whole range of these that he knew, along with English, had been first proved on a code of revenue regulations that he had drawn up for the government of Tipu Sultan. The comment of one of his later colonial patrons, Richard Clark, is telling, I'll quote, Ram Raz's translation of the revenue codes, he writes, is in every respect so correct and the notes and illustrations accompanying it exhibited so eminent a degree of knowledge in the several languages from which the terms and phrases used in the original were borrowed, that at that time this gave rise to considerable doubt of it being the unassistant performance of a Hindu. Now, despite the snide comment, it was this accomplished feat of translation that gave this Hindu his first break, a teaching post at the College of Fort St. George, and his linguistic and interpretative skills led his patron, Richard Clark, an official at Fort St. George, Madras, <coughs> to entrust him with the task of translating scattered fragments of some Sanskrit treatises on architecture that were still in circulation among masons and builders in South India. In this work, Essay on the Architecture of the Hindus, Ramras faced all the travails of modern textual scholarship. The exercise of collating and identifying disparate fragments of treatises, scouring out other related texts from the surrounding region, and comprehending the phraseology of these texts in terms of the larger discipline of the history of architecture in which they had to be placed. He wrote that he had in his possession what he could identify as segments of four separate Sanskrit treatises on temple construction and worship. <coughs> One was a 15th century Tamil text that he had consulted, which referred to the existence of 29 separate treatises on architecture and Hindu aesthetics from which he tried to identify the fragments he had recovered and the many he had seen still being used by builders and craftsmen in South Indian temple towns. <coughs> Ram Raz's great discovery at this stage was the most complete of the Sanskrit treatises of all the ones in his possession, the Manasar, which he also found to be the perfect exposition of the subject of temple building in southern India. He was able to piece together, he regrets, only 41% of the total 58 chapters, each detail dealing with different themes in temple construction and consecration. Out of the various themes of the chapter, ranging from astrology to rituals and image making, he extracted only those detailed sections that related to architecture per se. <coughs> His main endeavor, as we will see, is to take a traditional Sanskrit treatise and to present only those sections of it in Manasar that he could isolate as a specialized architectural elements, which if divested of all the extraneous matter in which they are bound, I quote, contain details of all technical names and proportions of several elements of the sacred edifice. The translated text thus offered a description of varying heights, proportions, and ornamental styles of every part of a temple. From the smallest parts, such as pedestals and pillar bases, to larger and larger parts, such as mandapams, porticos, vimanas, and gopurams. And look at the beautiful illustrations that accompany these, these line drawings. They're almost like modern architectural drawings. 
accompanied at the end of each section by these delicate and intricate line drawings. We are not sure who did the line drawings. They carry the name of the printer, but not of the draftsman. The temples of Srirangam, Kanchipuram, Tanjore, and Madurai served as models from which he created these diagrams of column, pilasters, and different stories, Vimanas, and Gokurams. <laughs> Each drawing replete with detail of ornamental and sculptural embellishments of these edifices. So we already understand the importance of visual documentation, something that would become very, very important later. You know, the detailed visual documentation of a building, particularly in a pre-photographic era, but even after photography came, the drawing, the detailed drawing remains a very, very important uh, aid to architectural documentation. Okay. Evident here is the construction of an elaborate classificatory scheme that could fit the format of the new disciplinary sciences and be presented as, I quote, the special orders and tremels of Hindu architecture. Richard Clarke's earlier disbelief that how could his revenue code be the work of an unassisted Hindu, assumes a particular resonance now as he goes on to present this work not only as an unassisted, but also a unique contribution of a native Hindu, something no European scholar could have produced with the same depth of knowledge of texts and objects concerned. Ram Raz's contribution lay then in his distinct status as an insider a Hindu adept at deciphering fragments of a Sanskrit aesthetic text and able at the same time to present it within the parameters of a new subject, the science of architecture to a Western readership. Ram Raja's own challenge lay in mediating between the abstruse language of the Sanskrit text, the specialized textual knowledge of the Brahmin pundits, and the more practical knowledge passed on from generation to generation of the artisan communities and builders. His letters to Richard Clarke went to lengths to explain the huge obstacles he faced in properly understanding the terms and usages of the text, even as he worked with the sculptor of the Kamata tribe of Tanjore. While the artisans were compelled to refer to the Brahmin pundits for explanation of the textual canons, the latter often had to fall back on the former for an understanding of the technical terms in their application to building process. So both need each other, the Brahmin Pandit and the actual practical work person. Neither group, though, could bridge the vast gap in communication. It was left to the new native expert, Ram Raja, to bypass this deadlock and perform a new act of mediation between norms and practices, texts and the temples, and most important, between a unique Indian treatise and its Western connoisseurs. As Ram Raja himself put it, I quote, the assistance of the artist on the one hand, of the philologist on the other, corroboration by reference to existing edifices, and the ability to exhibit the results at length deduced in the technical and scientific language of a foreign people were all equally necessary to the completion of the task. As would be acknowledged by all his peers, the task had been ably accomplished by Ram Raja. This ensured for his work the recognition of the contemporary European scholarly world and a sanctioned place in the later historiography of Indian temple architecture, where many scholars have returned to the work of Ram Raj and positioned it as one of the earliest examples of a Indian treatise on architecture put together. So there is a, a retrospective return to Ram Raj, particularly when it's involved the use of Sanskrit lexicon for temple forms. We know that a lot of later Hindu temple architecture use the vocabulary, Tamil and Sanskrit vocabulary, and I think Ram Raj lays the way for that. What his case nonetheless anticipates is the main route by which a new scholarship would enter the professional fray. That route was primarily one of textual and linguistic knowledge. A knowledge of old Indian languages, script, and texts 
was what came most readily to the Indian antiquarian scholar, including Rajendralal Mitra. It is also what was most critically in demand among Westerners in the field, because that's precisely the mediation they needed. And it is in this arena that a new group of Indians began to make a slow transition from the position of informants to that of scholars in their own right. So we have scholars in Western India. So the larger chapter goes into figures like Bhaudaji Lad in Western India, who's a very close equivalent to Rajendralal Mitra, to Bhagwan Lal Indraji. But here I'll focus on Rajendralal. Four decades later, after Ram Raj's work, Rajendralal Mitra enters the same field of scholarship and documentation of Indian temple architecture with two large compendiums, the double volume study titled The Antiquities of Urisha, Volume 1, 1875, Volume 2, 1880, and the volume titled Buddha Gaya, The Hermitage of Shakyamuni, 1878, both published under the auspices of the government of India. In 1868, when the government of Bengal, when the government of Bengal entrusted Rajendralal Mitra with the project of documenting the ancient architecture and sculpture of India, Rajendralal decided to focus on the architectural remains of Orissa, especially on the richly sculpted temples of Bhubaneswar. Uh, so I think these are his own photographs. Uh, they're not of very high quality. So he, these are his own daguerreotypes that he's taking of the Lingaraj temple complex and of course of the Konarak, absolutely in ruins then in the early 1870s. Uh, soon afterwards in 1874, the government of Bengal deputed him once again, this time to the, visit the dilapidated temple of Bodh Gaya, which I'll come to later in order to inspect the ongoing archaeological survey of the site, superintend the collection of scattered antiquities, and most urgently, control and check the operations of a Burmese restoration mission. I'll come to this later. In the four decades that elapsed between the time of Ram Raja and that of Rajendralal Mitra, there came about a slow but distinct professionalization of the sphere of antiquarian and archaeological studies in colonial India. The process was still in its inception when a scholar such as Rajendra Lal stepped into the picture and wrested for himself the kind of space for self-articulation that was clearly unavailable to figures like Ram Raja in the early years of the century. The profiles of Ram Raja and Rajendralal Mitra appear in connected but contrasting frames. Ram Raja in his time had moved from the role of native informant into that of the native expert. And it's an important transition. His acumen in both English and several vernacular languages allowed him to steadily ascend the ladder of employment and rank in early colonial government. Rajendralal Mitra in his time had a greater affinity to the figure of the Western educated Indian of mid 19th century who would effectively straddle the worlds of modern and traditional learning. Now here it's worth just briefly noting his own background. He's coming from a family background of Persian and Sanskrit scholarship. His father is a renowned scholar of Persian and Sanskrit, John Medrio Mitra. Uh, he's educated among other schools at Govindo Vashak's Hindu Free School, set up to provide a good English education to non-affluent Bengali boys. It is also important to note that due to extraneous factors, Rajendralal was unable to complete his education in either medicine or law. I mean, he joined the Calcutta Medical College but did not finish the degree. Similarly, he wanted to study law, but even that got disrupted. Instead, he came to be largely self and privately educated in different Western and Indian languages, English, French, German, Greek, and Latin on the one hand, and Sanskrit, Persian, Urdu, Hindi, Uriya, alongside his mother language, Bangla, on the other hand. This made of him an extraordinary polymath, a term that indicates erudition in several spheres of knowledge and multiple classical and modern languages. Ram Raj 
Raja was also distinguished by his proficiency in several vernacular languages, by his knowledge of Sanskrit and mastery of English. But what set apart a polymath like Rajendralal Mitra was the way such multilanguage skills now entered the new worlds of classical scholarship, both Oriental and Occidental, and secured a foothold in prime institutional sites, such as the Asiatic Society, the Indian Museum that had grown within the society, and the Archaeological Survey of India. An 1870 memorandum of the Archaeological Survey of India had expressly stated, and I quote, that as far as possible, intelligent <coughs> natives should be employed and trained in the task of photography, measuring and surveying buildings, directing excavations, and deciphering inscriptions. Uh, epigraphy, or the reading of ancient scripts and inscriptions, was identified as a key area of archaeological research with maximum potential for roping in and training native scholars. And under J. F. Fleet, who became epigraphist in the archaeological survey, even a separate fund was allocated to encourage the study of epigraphy among native scholars. While the main motive behind this was a desire to draw on this rich resource of linguistic skills, another aim was, I quote, to train them in such habits of accuracy and critical judgment as should fit them hereafter for taking a prominent place in historical research. Remember, this is what Max Muller is also saying, that he has that element of accuracy and judgment which other scholars don't. So these issues of accuracy and judgment would be made the crucial test of eligibility for a new Indian scholarship, set up as the exacting standards of the modern disciplines of archaeology and history. They would extract as great as they would exert as great a sway over the Indian as the Western scholar. By the 1870s. Rajendralal Mitra's integration within the main institutions of interlogical and archaeological research in 19th century India was complete. Entrusted with important government projects, he was infused with a fervent ardor to collect, preserve, and document the antiquities of the land. He also imbibed from his European peers a romantic fascination with ruins, like we see here, and relics to which he added his own yearning to search out in them the lineaments of his own national past. He also began to work with many of the same aids and accoutrements of European scholarship. He had at his own service his own native assistants, especially his own pundit, Ramanath Torkoratno, as he went about his task of scouring various centers in Bengal and Bihar in search of ancient Sanskrit manuscripts for collection and preservation in the Asiatic society. As he undertook his study of the Orissa temples and worked towards the book, The Antiquities of Orissa, he similarly had at his disposal a team of the finest native molders and draftsmen. Selected from among the best students of the Government School of Art, Calcutta, to make drawings, lithographs, and plaster casts of the architectural ornaments and sculptures. Now, he was commissioned by the Royal Society of Arts, but a lot of them also came into the Indian Museum. So Rajendralal Mitra is also bringing a lot of these plaster casts into the Indian Museum. And Henry Hoverlock, who is principal of the Government School of Cal Art Calcutta, is providing his best student and then teacher of oil painting, Anoda Prashad Bakchi, to lead the team. And I show here drawings leading into lithographs. Just as he relied heavily on the labors and judgments of his pundit in collecting manuscripts and discerning their value, he remained equally indebted to the accuracy and fidelity of the reproductions produced by the art school student team in this volume, The Antiquities of Orissa. It is the solidity of this internal structure of support that enabled Rajendralal Mitra in each case to speak and act with the authority that he did. This was as true of the Western antiquarian and archaeologist as it was of his new Indian equivalent. 
At this point, though, it is also necessary to scrutinize such assumptions of equivalence. In what ways would the grounds shift in the production of authority of the Indian scholar? How would new subject positions be articulated within this demarcated professional space? Rajendralal Mitra, it seems, needed to continually negotiate, and I think this is an important point I want to put out, the double identity of a modern scholar and a critical insider. I think several decades later, we are all trying to do the same, right? We are still trying to negotiate these two fields of being a critical scholar, but somewhere being an insider in the field. A closer look at his work and writing shows the strains of these negotiations. It opens up the process whereby the sense of a native, now redefined as an Indian point of view, would be repeatedly inserted within the orders of modern knowledges about the ancient Indian past. Now this section is called Narratives of Loss and Recuperation. I have a section here which is on his collecting of manuscripts. We know that what dominates his intellectual profile is his textual scholarship. His laborious work of collecting, cataloging, translating, and annotating old Sanskrit manuscripts, one of which, one of the anthologies, have been republished today. I'll leave that section out for the sake of time. I'll just end with one thing that Rajendralal Mitra says. Uh, his prime objective in collecting manuscripts and bringing out these catalogues and anthologies, was to create a complete inventory and record of, I quote, the number and nature of Sanskrit manuscripts now extant in the country. For such a record would be the only means of conveying information about them to European Orientalists. So he's still working largely for the European Orientalists. Rajendralal Mitra's greatest pride lay in the unremitting labor of his archival enterprise and in the manuscript collection he succeeded in building within the Asiatic society. By 1879-80, when he's on the verge of leaving the Asiatic Society, he could record the purchase of over 1,500 manuscripts and the preparation of over 5,000 lists and notices. I hope the society still has these lists and notices. I'd love to look at them at some point. As he later reflected, I quote, had the society done nothing else in the course of its career of 100 years, he's writing this in the centenary volume, this collection would suffice to secure it the thanks of future generations. So he's very clear that it's in this textual documentation that he does that uh, the real achievement of the Asiatic society lies. But I'll turn to his documentation and study of monuments because that was my area of primary interest. In the move from what he calls literary to architectural relics, so he refers to the manuscripts as literary relics, you know, like an object, that the collector would be transmuted into the historian, that he would emerge from the particularities of the material he assembled and ordered into a generalized vision of India's classical antiquity and civilization. His writings would always be caught in a multi-directional flow from the concrete to the abstract and vice versa. The civilizational agenda remained grounded in the archival base. The practices of an empirical historiography re required the presentation of masses of corroborative detail, the testing of each large claim about the history of Indian architecture and sculpture by the assemblage of material as evidence. So already we see this deep commitment to empirical historiography, something that could be tested against material evidence. His obsessive preoccupation with detail and evidence disallowed him, it has been regretted by later scholars, from attempting a complete history of ancient India in spite of possessing the requisites of a capable historian. Yet it could be argued that an entity imagined as ancient India, India's own variant of a classical civilization, was already available for antiquarians like him. It was not a question of withholding judgment on a complete history of India until he had the evidence. 
Rather, Rajendralal was involved in a far more fundamental process of creating the materials for the already established object of ancient India, and then battling to reinterpret this material in terms of the legitimate narratives which can prove a nation's existence. As with manuscripts, so also with the field of antiquities, Rajendrala's main concerns were with documentation, collecting documentation and restoration. In 1868, when he turned to the study of the temples of Orissa, as I mentioned, he was working with a scheme floated by the Royal Society of Arts London for the preparation of plaster casts and drawings of important architectural specimens from India. Rajanulal Mitra had suggested to the government that the focus should be on the Hindu architectural remains at Orissa and that he should expand the project into writing a historical and descriptive account of the temples. The Antiquities of Orissa, a magnum opus of archaeological scholarship, materialized seven years later. Rajanulal would be closely by guided by the directives of the new archaeological establishment, which was to describe and investigate the history associated with ancient monuments of India and to illustrate that research with plans, drawings, and photographs. So here we have the photographs, and here are the kinds of detailed plans and drawings that he supplies. Fully committed to the scientificity of the enterprise, he would employ these tropes of truth and objectivity to project onto these monuments the imaginings and claims of an Indian nation, a nascent Indian nation. In the same years, Rajendralal Mitra began his work on the Buddhist site of Bodh Gaya, again on a government deputation. His main brief was to facilitate the archaeological survey and restoration of the temple by curbing the operations of a religious restoration mission that had been dispatched to Bodh Gaya by the Burmese king Minden. So these are his photographs of Bodh Gaya, and we see what a ruined state in which he encounters Bodh Gaya in 1876. Uh, now, as will be well known to many of you, it is at Bodh Gaya that the colonial state would face in the subsequent decades some of the most virulent counterclaims of a monument. On one hand, the archaeological survey. On the other hand, the Hindu Shaivite monk and the Mahabodhi Society, all battling for the possession of the temple. The dispute was yet to fully erupt in the sense that the Shaivite monk is fully in control and the government archaeological team was beginning to work there. Uh, when Rajanullah arrived there in the winter of 1876 as a representative of state authority and scientific archaeology, in a bid to restore the ruined temple from its illegitimate Shaivite Giri uh, claimant and restore its true history. The temple, as we can see in this photograph, was in a state of ruin, almost on the threat of becoming rubble. There was also the work of the Burmese restoration mission going on, where the traditional royal practices of renovation of a sacred monument found themselves as odd with the modern historical and archaeological view of restoration. The Burmese repairs and improvements entirely acceptable to the temple Mohant, who extended his warm hospitality to the team and even gave his land for building a guest house. So the Burmese guest house at Bodh Gaya is one of the oldest ones that is set up there. So what is acceptable to the Mohant caused great alarm to the Indian archaeologist Rajendralal Mitra, who saw them as resulting only in the destruction of critical primary evidence. He would be categorical in his denouncement of, I quote, the irreparable damages wrought by the Burmese. He writes, the Burmese gentlemen were doubtless very pious and enthusiastic in the cause of their religion, but they were working on no systematic or traditional plan. They were ignorant of the true history of their faith and perfectly innocent of all the knowledge of architecture and the requirements of archaeology and history. And the mischief they have done by their misdirected zeal has been serious. 
true knowledge of Buddhist religion and history now became the sole prerogative of modern scholarship. Its methodological and investigative tools came to Rajendra Lal Mitra aid as he sought to recover Bodhka's ancient past and deduce the original structure of the great temple and its courtyard by piecing together a variety of evidences. Of course, drawing primarily on the travel accounts of the two ancient Chinese pilgrims, Fa Hien and Huen Sang. I'm aware that their Chinese pronunciations are very different now. I'm sticking to the older one. As with the Odisha temples at Bodhgaya too, Rajendralal Mitra's detailed survey and photographic documentation of the site culminated in a lavish pul publication called Buddha Gaya, the Hermitage of Shakyamuni, the first authoritative book on the site, which reconstructed Bodh Gaya in its physical setting in Buddhist mythology and history, and with all the details of the main temple and scattered architectural antiquities. A decade later, it would be left to the expertise of Alexander Cunningham and his assistant J.D. Begler to restore and remake what Rajendralal Mitra had invoked in text. So in a way, Rajendralal Mitra anticipates this restoration. And so it is with the launch of an extensive archaeological program of repair and renovation of the Great Temple under the orders of the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal. So Rajendralal Mitra's book also anticipates Cunningham's own monograph called Mahabodhi. At the head of the first volume, Antiquities of Orissa, appeared this quotation. These are some of the relics of the past, weeping over a lost civilization and an extinguished grandeur. In Rajalula and Mitra, the empirical agenda of the historian of extracting evidence from architecture coexisted with the romantic pathos of ruins and a classicist nostalgia. Monumental remains, he believed, were both an object of yearning and romantic belonging, but also they were meant to rectify and fill in the gaps of written history. In India, he regretted most of the sovereign and great men, I'm quoting, live not in the pages of Xenophon or Thukydides, but in fanciful fables, rude coins, moldering ruins, and blotted inscriptions. So the historian had no choice but to reconstruct a history from the ruins themselves, a history not just of building and sculpting, but also of rulers and dynasties, of religions and customs, and social usages of the period. This is where the new Indian scholar was treading the same methodological grounds as his colonial predecessor, James Ferguson, who had pioneered the study of Indian architectural history. It is from this shared epistemological ground that Rajendralal used Ferguson's work as a nodal point of both reference and refutation as he proceeded to correct the history that Ferguson had given to Indian architecture. So these two images are from two of his earliest publications. The one above is from the book called Picturesque Illustrations of Ancient Architecture in Hindustan, 1848. And this engraving of Ajanta is from his book, The Rock Cut Temples of India, 1860s. Now, this section is called the grounds of contention. Uh, can I go on for a bit longer? Yeah, OK, all right. Okay. The two volumes of the antiquities of Orissa, so I return to that again from the Buddha Gaya book, emerge in this context as a pivotal text. It offers a model of an ancient classical civilization that is as steeped in European lineage as it is marked by a sense of nationality. Rajendralal Mitra's choice of the temples of Urissa is a very important choice in his terms because he talks about how Urissa is insulated in space, time, and history. And therefore, the temples of Urissa, I quote, are more authentic than what are often to be found in other parts of India. And what he means by the term authentic is, of course, worth exploring and are of special interest and significance for the antiquarian. The case for antiquity and authenticity 
in this book, in his Antiquities of Orissa, came to focus primarily on the complex, the grand ensemble of the Lingaraj temple complex of Bhubaneswar. Through a chain of claims about stylistic origins and influence, artistic form and content. What was centrally at stake for Rajendralal was the evaluation of Hindu temple architecture with its profusion of ornament and sculpture as a fine art form. If you'll know that everybody then is debating whether Indian art and architecture has a fine art status. Architectural ornament became a key motive to be recovered, revalidated, and made the central trope in entitling ancient Hindu temple architecture to take rank, I quote him, as a really fine art. Uh, here he, we see how he draws his cues directly from Ferguson, but reverses them. Ferguson had believed that the overabundance of ornament in medieval Hindu architecture was a sign of its decadence. For Rajendralal Mitra, it becomes a marker of its grandeur, the very soul of our architectural monument. It is what determined India's place in the history of art, affording the oldest and most interesting illustrations of the taste for magnificence which manifested itself among the people of Orissa. Rajanulal Mitra goes on to construct a place for architectural ornamentation. Famously, these are not his photographs, these are later photographs of most famously the Konarok Temple and the Konarok Wheel. He goes on to construct a place for ornamentation that makes it central to both the unity and diversity of the Indian architectural tradition. Architectural ornament throughout India was seen to be held by an internal unity of design. The corbels, the medallions, the panels, the mouldings, the scrolls and the temples of northern India, southern India and Orissa are all closely similar. The same forms, the same figures, the same proportions, variously combined and elaborated turn up wherever the observer directs the eye. And they display a community of thought and inspiration on the part of the builders, which could not have resulted unless the Tamilians and the Aryans had drawn from one common source. So I'll just show you uh, just some examples from the temples of Belur Halebid, which are almost of the same period as the Konarak temple, to show this kind of excess of sculpture and architectural ornamentation. Anybody who's visited Belur Halebid will know that it is uh, stunning to the levels of architectural ornamentation. The Urissa temples, he returns, so he brings the analogy with the South Indian temple, the Tamilian, the Hoysala, the Chola temple, the Hoysala temple. The Urissa temples for Rajendralal Mutra then stood as a microcosm of a larger pan-Indian architectural history whose internal cohesiveness could be mapped in a common evolution of canons, treatises, designs, ornamental and sculptural features. The argument about form merged inexorably with an assertion of an Aryan identity as community of thought and inspiration in architecture, and which came to be marked out in an overall catch-all category called an Indo-Aryan type. That common type, he believed, could be discerned as much in the aesthetics of ornament and the proportions of columns and pedestals as in the features of the sculpted figures. Okay. Now, Ferguson once again provides Rajendralal Mitra with a model for another kind of treatment of sculpture. As social and ethnographic data, as evidence of religious belief, customs, dress, instruments and weaponry of a period. What Ferguson had tried to project through the sculptures of Sanchi and Amaravati, I show these as frontispieces of his book, where he's reading Sanchi and Amaravati as ethnographic data to talk about custom, ritual, costume, ceremonies. Rajadulal Mitra is attempting to do the same with the profusion of sculptures he encounters on the Urissa temples, trying to draw from them details of costume, gestures, motives, weapons, animals, daily life, so on. 
Although partaking of the same approach, Rajendralal Mitra was again quick to define his conclusions. Rejecting Ferguson's view on racial mixing and hybridization and his classification of the Uriya temple as non-Aryan, he emphatically argued for the Indo-Aryan pedigree of the sculpted figures of Bhuvaneshwar, Puri, and Konarak temples. Now, of course, this is a highly sensitive and difficult area to make these judgments on Aryan pedigrees, but Rajendralal Mitra was deeply invested in it. These minor points of difference with Ferguson would soon lead to a more fundamental parting of opinion. Rajendralal's main challenge to Ferguson concerned the latter's opinion about the non-existence of stone architecture in India before the age of Ashok and the contact with Bactrian Greeks. And he had a theory of the replication of prior wooden models in the first stone buildings in India of the first and second centuries BC. In refutation, Rajendralal Mitra constructed a complex argument about the nature of proof and evidence in the field. To him, the very maturity and finish of the Ashokan stone pillars, the Rampurva Bull Capital, the Lion Bull Capital, this is in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the others in the Shannath Museum. To him, the very maturity and finish of the Ashokan stone pillars and of the sculpted friezes of the caves of Udaygiri and Khandagiri of a near contemporary period suggested a long pre-existing autonomous tradition of building and sculpting in stone in ancient India. The proportion, base, and ornamentation of the Ashokan pillars, he asserted, were all characteristics of an original style, a style which must have taken centuries before, before it was brought to the state of perfection in which we find it at the time of Ashoka. Rajendralal Mitra was at pains to prove that the art of stone architecture and sculpture in India was an ancient and homegrown tradition dating back far beyond its first surviving historical specimens, conceding nothing by way of precedence to the influence of Greek, Egyptian or Assyrian sources, which Ferguson was emphasizing. Ferguson's theory of the transition from wood to stone was also dismantled. Okay. Mm. okay. The survival and carryover of styles in early Indian stone architecture, was argued, was not from earlier wooden models or even from Greek buildings, but rather from the non-Aryan Tamilian temple traditions of the South. James Ferguson immediately rose to the bait, the fact that he's opposing Ferguson openly, responding to Rajendralal's work with a virulence that overtly gave the came away. What was being debated was a subject as innocuous as the history of stone architecture in India and the perennially contested matters of origin and influence in art history. But for both contestants, there were much larger issues at stake. For Rajendrula Mitra, India's architectural history had become the testing grounds of the nation's antiquity and Aryan lineage. And the art of building and sculpting in stone had been rendered into a matter of national pride to be claimed for India's distant past and to be expunged of any foreign connection and influence. It is, however, Ferguson's reactions that most dramatically politicized the debate, pushing the issue far beyond the scholarly terrain of proof and evidence. At one level, Ferguson can be seen, seen as simply standing up for the veracity of his own analysis of the evolutionary pattern in Indian architecture, clarifying his unchanged views on the subject and pointing out Rajendralal Mitra's frequent misrepresentation of his opinion. So this we know happens continuously. The scholars have said that this is not a correct interpretation. Okay. But Ferguson also quickly slides from the high ground of pure academic debate and neutrality. The patriotic postures of the native would be more than countered by the arrogant indignation of the European. For both, the real battle was occurring offstage, blurring the boundaries between the academic and the political. 
Ferguson's self-defense would be cloaked in layers of racial venom towards one he clearly considered his social and intellectual inferior. His response to Rajendralal Mitra took on the form of an entire book, which many of you will be aware of. It is called Archaeology in India, with special reference to the works of Babu Rajendralal Mitra, 1884 which stands as a telling document of colonial insecurity and consternation regarding the Western educated Indian, especially the most dangerous species among them, the Bengali Babu. They were causing them a lot of trouble by this time. Ferguson's deliberate choice of the appellation Babu for Rajendralal rather than Raja, he already has the title Raja, has a cutting edge. The Babu confronted the imperial masters with the most unhappy consequence of their educative mission. His insolence and insubordination were seen to epitomize the dangers involved in breaking the traditional influences of religion and caste in a society and replacing these with the influences of an education that only ended up eroding the moral authority by which they were governed. I quote Ferguson, one of the first effects of educating any set of men beyond anything known in their own class and of treating them as equals before they have acquired any title morally and intellectually to be considered as such is to inspire them with the most inordinate conceit in themselves, end quote. Ferguson saw Rajendralal as a typical prototype of this class, of its conceit self-delusion and faulty assimilation of Western knowledge, that he appeared to partake of the, same uh, of the same commitment to scientific knowledge, and that he could garner the support and confidence of the government of India made him an all the more volatile entity. By his own admission, Ferguson's, Rajendrala's case opened the doors to some of the larger political controversies of the day, to Lord Lytton's Vernacular Press Act of 1878, which had sought to clamp down on the license of the native press to gross unfounded slander of the European community. It referred even more to the furor raised around the famous Ilbert Bill of 1883, which threatened to subject the British in India to the jurisdiction of native judges. The central question was whether the natives of India were to be treated as equals of Europeans in all respects. Rajendrala's temerity in contradicting Ferguson's scholarship brought home the hazards of an untenability of such an equation. I quote Ferguson again, though Indian archaeology may be considered as beneath the attention of the English public, the Ilbert Bill is certainly not so, and no means of bringing it home appears to me so appropriate as examining a typical specimen of one of the proposed class of governors and seeing what stuff they're made of. For this purpose, there's probably no example so suitable as Babu Rajendralal. So he's directly tying it up with the Ilbert Bill and the entire racist prejudice. Rajendralal's challenges also provided Ferguson with the occasion to reassert his proprietary field over hold over a scholarly field that he had inaugurated in the 1840s and held monopoly over for several decades. By 1880, Ferguson was at the tail end of his career, looking back on decades of study and writing, steeped in the assurance that the subject was almost wholly under his command, confident that from his off-site location in England, he could date, identify, and categorize any ancient building in India. Ferguson has the very famous quotation that if I see a photograph of an Indian architectural uh, building, I can tell you within 10 years of when it was constructed and within 10 miles of where it is located. Even if he had never seen the monument, he felt he had such command over the field. Now, as his competitor in the field, Rajendralal Mitra's knowledge of the subject was shown up to be shallow and superficial, undeserving of the responsibilities he had undertaken. 
The Babu was thus pushed into the slot of primarily a Sanskrit scholar, by which he had obtained his name and fame, who had wandered into the study of architecture with, I quote, no knowledge of architectural draftsmanship, surveying, or plan drawing, even to a limited degree. So look at the hierarchy of knowledges and the tensions. This was a pointed devaluation of textual versus architectural scholarship, with Indian expertise relegated purely to the former category. Such an exercise was crucial for the preservation of authority, especially for distinguishing Western archaeological scholarship from the primarily linguistic and textual expertise of the natives who had entered the field. The divide did not stop there. Ferguson was equally bent on asserting the Western prerogative of a scientific knowledge at large. The problem, as he saw it, lay not just with Rajendralal Mitra, but with native knowledge in general, a knowledge that was based on memory rather than scientific training and lacked the powers of careful reasoning. Ferguson, in retrospect, can be seen to desperately cling on to prerogatives that were slipping away from European scholars to a growing body of modern Indian subjects. The field could no longer belong to just an Alexander Cunningham or James Ferguson. In fact, it was not even in the interests of the expanding archaeological establishment in colonial India to retain such spheres of exclusion. As we noticed, they needed to train Indians. The 1880s and 90s would witness the slow but distinct formation of new spaces of professional training and participation of scholars that would boost and buttress the institutional edifice. Ferguson's main resentment also had been on how Rajendralal Mitra's work carried the support of the government like of Bengal. So he was really incensed that the government of Bengal was supporting him, even as he was openly contradicting him. Now, it was this government, its scholarly and administrative apparatus of archaeological research, and its many rungs of service that now began to provide the main avenue of sustenance for a new group of Indians. The singularity of a scholar like Rajendralal Mitra in his time would give way to a substantive presence of Indians in the archaeological profession and museum's administration over the late 19th and the early decades of the 20th century. Antiquarian knowledge was also now replaced by more narrow disciplinary specializations. This process led to a closing of the gap between Western and Indian scholarship, a gap of the kind that Ferguson had proclaimed. But a sense of difference, difference in both the form and content of scholarship would never be entirely erased. Over the early 20th century, it would be invested with new meanings and nuances in an attempt to define autonomous spaces for the Indian scholar in the field. Even as the first scholarly incursions made by Ram Raja and Rajendralal Mitra opened the way for the growing nationalization of the subject of India's art and architectural history. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have taken longer than I thought. Madam Tabuti Ghota Kurata, the illustrious speaker of this evening's Rajendolal Memorial Lecture being organized by the Asiatic Society, General Secretary of the Asiatic Society, Treasurer Asiatic Society, my fellow Council members who are present here and illustrious members of the audience. We have just now heard with rapt attention the scholarly address given by Madam Tapoti Gothakurata on the multifarious 
levels of contribution by Raja Rajendra Lal Mitra. Rajendra Lal has been aptly described as a polymath, a person who did not confine himself to any particular boundary of knowledge. He didn't have any formal training, didn't have any degree of the university. As it has been mentioned, he was admitted to the Calcutta Medical College, couldn't complete. He was admitted to the law college or legal training, but even that he could not complete. But then he was largely a self-taught man, a person who has excelled in many, many directions and wherever he has traveled, he has Wherever he has travelled, he has left his footprint extensively and intensively. Ascetic society has been privileged to get the scholarship of Rajendralal in its own fold. He joined Rajendra Lal joined the Ascetic Society as a librarian as early as in 1836. 46. 46. 46. 46, yes. Continued as a librarian for 10 years. Then subsequently he became associated with the governing body of the Asiatic Society, became vice president of Asiatic Society for three times, and ultimately in 1885 became the first Indian president of Asiatic Society. But to remember that Asiatic Society being primarily a colonial heritage, bearing a colonial heritage. Uh, membership of Indians was not initially opened for them. It was only in 1829 that membership was opened for the Indians. And before Rajendralal, a few Indians of repute, uh, some of the names have been mentioned here, became members of Asiatic society, contributed in their own ways, but Rajendola's contribution was immense, and this was not limited only to the, his association with the Asiatic society. He belonged to an illustrious family, and uh, the family had a heritage of scholarship which Rajendola inherited. Then, he, Madam has mentioned the various areas of contributions made by Rajendralal. The principal works of Rajendralal are the Antiquities of Orisha, completed in two volumes, then the Bodhgaya, which was published in 1878, then the indo aryan the indo aryans and then this work which has been reprinted today uh, the sanskrit buddhist literature of nepal but apart from that there are many areas of rajendralal's interest i am not going to repeat what has been said by professor gothakrota this evening, but I want to mention 
that apart from these scholastic areas of interest of Rajendralal, there were many other areas where he associated himself. For example, the cataloging, translation and commentary on the various manuscripts which as a person associated with the Asiatic society, he did the job with the Pandits in an elaborate manner. And then the archaeology, the archaeological contributions and uh, as expressed in, the, in, his, in his work, the antiquities of Orisha and where he had a, a debate with Ferguson, James Ferguson. And uh, I'm not go again going into that debate, which has been mentioned here very uh, efficiently. Uh, but what is of interest here to note that uh, not only that Rajendralal stuck to his point of view, but he could establish his point of view as apart from the criticisms which are made by Ferguson. He had a nationalistic uh, uh, scholarship and uh, he, uh, he challenged and debated Ferguson's argument that it was uh, the Western type of influence which was uh, primarily uh, responsible for this type of work. This is not uh, so. Uh, he, he established that point of view very clearly. Then there is, there is the element of vernacularization uh, of uh, the language, of the culture, of the heritage, and uh, maps, photos, etc., which were meant for the ordinary members of the public. These were published by uh, Rajendralal. Uh, he was a he vernacularized uh, the whole domain of scholarship which was available and published a section for rendering European scientific terms in India. Uh, and uh, he was a member of the Vernacular Literature Society, Calcutta School Book Society, then uh, uh, the text of Bengali grammar uh, and so on and so forth. And again, he excelled himself in the area of publication in the magazines, in the journals. And there, the mention, name, name has been mentioned, Bibidhartha Sangraho, that is the articles which began to be published in that journal with which Rajendralal was intimately associated uh, for the uh, roughly 10 years of its publication. And uh, uh, I am glad to mention here that the Asiatic Society has taken up that task of reprinting, collecting the entire publication of Bibidhartha Sangraho. Day before yesterday, we had a meeting where a scholar scholar, I mean the, a scholar was, uh, post was created uh, in order to, uh, in order to help the society to, uh, um, to expedite its publication and uh, day after tomorrow there will be a meeting for the uh, selection of that scholar. So we hope that within one year uh, the Bibidhartha Sangro will be published in a book form, in a volume, in several volumes. Uh, so, the vernacularization project was uh, there where the Bibidhartha Sangraha was a, was a very novel idea of, uh, uh, of making to the uh, general students, general public, the scholarship, the scholastic uh, opinion of the scholastic aspect of the, uh, uh, the product, uh, cultural product. A apart from that, apart from what has been mentioned here, there are various elements in the socio-political activities of Rajendralal. 1885, he became a member, he became the president of uh, Asiatic Society, 
but it was the same year that the first Indian National Congress uh, 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 first meeting was held and Rajendra was a member of the reception committee of the Indian National Congress. Uh, so, he was not, not only a scholar in the, in the western sense of the term, but he was a scholar who was interested in depicting the contribution of India, Indian culture, Indian heritage, and he did whatever is possible in that area. So, uh, in that capacity, uh, Rajendra Lal uh, was uh, a supporter of widow remarriage, he was against the uh, 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 multiple marriage, poly, polygyny of uh, the people, polygamy. He was a director of the world's institution. He was the president of British Indian Association and president of, as I mentioned, reception committee of the Indian National Congress. He was a justice of the peace of the Calcutta Metropolitan Corporation. So he extended his uh, activities, capacities in various fields of work. So such is the man who uh, was associated with Asiatic society. Asiatic society has uh, uh, given honor, shown honor to him, uh, respect for him uh, throughout his existence. But it is only in the past few years that we have institutionalized our respect for Rajendra Lal Mitro, in the sense that uh, this uh, Rajendra Lal Mitro annual lecture is being, uh, has been created and this is being given every year uh, from 2017 onwards. And uh, this building has been uh, opened, inaugurated and it has been named after Rajendra Lal Mitro. So we, in that way we are, uh, we are just, uh, we are just uh, accepting our, uh, our regards, gratitude uh, to Rajendra Lal Mitro. Madam has uh, mentioned that the initial uh, phase of her lecture, Max Muller's, uh, uh, Max Muller's uh, eulogization of Rajendra Lal Mitro. Uh, I would uh, quote it again, once again. As Max Muller said, he has uh, he has edited Sanskrit texts after a careful collection of manuscripts and in the various contributions to the journals of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, that was the name which was there at that time, Asiatic Society of Bengal, he has proved himself completely above the prejudices of his class, freed from the, freed from freed from the erroneous views of the history and literature in India in which every Brahmin is brought up and thoroughly imbued. Rajendra incidentally was not a Brahmin, but whatever it may be. Uh, and so the, that was the uh, reference which was given by Max Muller. And Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, has mentioned about Rajendra Lal that Mitro could work with both hands. He was an entire association condensed into one man. So this was the uh, appreciation of Rajendra Lal during his lifetime and immediately after his expiry. It can be mentioned here that Rajendra Lal died in the year 1891, uh, the same year uh, when uh, Vidyasava died. And uh, there was a condolence meeting at the Calcutta Town Hall uh, immediately after that, where both these great sons of India, Vidyasava and Rajendra Lal, they were jointly uh, given homage by the citizens of uh, Calcutta. So this is how Rajendra Lal has been remembered throughout his life and subsequently after that. So I think that uh, Asiatic society has within its treasure the manuscripts which were edited, collected, written by 
Rajendralal with the help of various pundits and the, the number is so enormous that not even uh, the entire job has been done even after 200 years of the existence of Asiatic society. So I uh, take this occasion to pay my respect and gratitude to that great scholar and I hope that the glorious tradition uh, of Rajendralal Mitro in his association with the Asiatic society will be remembered forever. Thank you very much. There is a citation to be handed over to the speaker which says, the Asiatic society is pleased to award Raja Rajendralal Mitro Memorial Lectureship for the year 2020 to Professor Tapati Gothakurta for her notable contributions in the field of Indological Studies. Madam. Big clap, big hand to Professor Tapati uh, Gothakurta. <laughs> a respected uh, formal president, former president of Asiatic Society, Professor Pallav Shengupto, uh, <coughs> Professor Tapoti Gothakurta, Professor uh, Dr. Shottopoto Chakraborty, our respected council members, guests, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon everybody. We are at the close of this today's meeting. I <coughs> taking the opportunity of giving vote of thanks to you all. Uh, all you have uh, particularly today's <coughs> uh, endowment lecture given by Professor Tapati Gothakurta. Uh, Raja Rajendralal Memorial, Vitro Memorial Lecture uh, entitled From Pandit to Scholar Positioning Raja Rajendralal Mitro Within the World of Antiquarian Scholarship in 19th Century India. I, we, I on behalf of Asiatic Society, must express our thanks and gratitude to Professor Tapoti <coughs> Gothakurta for our illuminating lecture, particularly throwing light on the archaeological excellence of uh, Raja Rajanural Mitro in explaining the, uh, the temples and monuments of Orisha and ancient India. I must uh, express our thanks to Professor Pallav Shengupto for releasing the book, uh, uh, reprinted book, uh, the Sanskrit Buddhist literature in Nepal, which, is, which has been reprinted by the Asiatic Society, written by Raja, uh, Raja Nural Mitro. And I, on behalf of Asiatic Society, express my thanks and gratitude to you all who are present here in today's memorial lecture. Thank you. Thanks to everybody.